Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. This morning, we'll continue our reading and discussion of this wonderful Protestant work entitled The History of Romanism by John Dowling. Yesterday, we concluded at the bottom of page 303, if you're following along, and the author describes how the papacy demonized the true Bible-believing Christians and the various uh, names by which they identified themselves, the Cathari, the Puritans, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the, the, the names are extensive, I won't try to rehearse them all, but I've lumped them all together under the title of Protestants. They had one thing in common. They rejected the papacy as not the vicar of Christ, but the vicar of Satan. Okay, The man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, that's what they believed. They all believed it. And they lumped these godly people together with sects of other various names who were criminal elements in the empire. They were killers, and they were enemies of the Roman Catholic Church for reasons possibly other than religion. The the author really doesn't describe them in any, any other terms, but then but that what the Roman Catholic Church described them, and that is that they were a criminal element in the empire. So, the papacy made no distinction between the holy, the Protestants, and the profane, rank killers. And under the common name that the Pope gave these two groups, heretics, and then commanded the kings of the empire to assemble all of their military strengths to destroy these these heretics, a crusade was launched. And multitudes, countless multitudes, were killed. Europe was in a state of war against anyone who spoke ill of the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church. Now this unfair... Uh, association that the papacy made between these two groups to incite all of Europe to war against them was an object of discussion in this country in the 19th century. It was the subject of a debate between Bishop Hughes and a man by the name of Mr. Breckenridge. And at the bottom of page 303, the author gives us an overview of that debate between the Roman Catholic Bishop, uh, Bishop Hughes, and this Mr. Breckenridge. And I'm reading from this, and this is very important for us to understand how this debate went and what the conclusion was by Mr. Hughes, by Bishop Hughes. And I'll read it for our edification and understanding. He says, Mr. Hughes, that is the bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, Hughes, quotes both of the above extracts for the purpose of convicting Mr. Breckenridge of duplicity. Because he did not quote the second, okay, the second part of the extract. When the object of Mr. Breckenridge was to show the persecutions carried on, not against the persons named in the second extract, but against those named in the first. So so what is he telling? He's telling us that this crusade, although it went, uh, uh, it was promoted on the guise that these were criminal elements in the empire, that the first uh, element of, of the decree were the, the, the Protestants. They were harmless people. Okay, so there was an open and public debate in this country. It was publicized. This open controversy between Bishop Hughes and Mr. Breckenridge. And how the point was trying to be made that there was no crime by these Waldenses, by these Puritans. 
they were not criminals. They were not violent criminals. They were peaceable. They were irreproachable by Rome's own account. They were godly people, and as much as said that they were better Christians than any Roman Catholic. All right? Now it says, Mr. Hughes, the bishop, then without drawing any distinction between these two classes, remember they make no distinction between the holy and the profane, neither does this Roman Catholic Bishop Hughes in this debate make any distinction. He says, Mr. Hughes, then without making any distinction between the two classes, coolly implies, quote, I wonder whether men of such a stamp would be reduced to the penitentiary if they committed such crimes in our day and in our country. Okay? What does that tell you? The author gives us the conclusion. He says, Thus endeavoring to brand with infamy those simple and holy people whose characters even Roman Catholic historians are forced to confess were pure and irreproachable. And he says the coolness with which this popish bishop in this free United States of America and in the 19th century speaks about the consigning such to the penitentiary, betraying the malignance of a St. Dominic or Montfort, against all, like the poor, per persecuted Waldenses or Cathari, are guilty of the crime of heresy and shows that he wants nothing but the power to consign to the penitentiary or to the cells of the Inquisition the heretics in the United States. Okay? This was a public debate in this country in the 19th century between a Roman Catholic bishop and Mr. Breckenridge, a historian, where they were talking about this very incident that we've been listening to, that we've been reading. How the papacy lumped together with the criminal element of, of Europe these godly Waldensian, these Protestant people, and who were all consigned to prison or killed as history relates. They were mercilessly pursued and slaughtered all over Europe. And the Roman Catholic bishop just wonders if, if, if such the same types of people were reduced to the penitentiary in this country. The open suggestion of this Roman Catholic bishop in the 19th century in the United States of America was that all heretics enemies of the church you remember that's the definition of heretic if you're an enemy of the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope you are a heretic and that such criminal element in this country should be reduced to the prison the penitentiary to do penance that's Rome's intention that's Rome's open stated intention it's on record, and Rome has never distanced itself from Rome has never apologized for this. So, who is the most powerful person in every locality? No matter where you live in this country, who is the most powerful person in your location? It's the local bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. And is the, these emissaries of the Pope who have their first and only allegiance with the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, who has struck a perpetual crusade against heresy. Its intent is to consign all heretics to the penitentiary. And that's being polite. Okay? There aren't enough penitentiaries in the world to, to, to carry us all. And that's why this crusade is established by the papacy to kill, to torture, to maim, and to burn at the stake those who are enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. Those who preach that the papacy is the Antichrist, that the Roman Catholic Church is that Babylonian whore of Revelation chapter 17. 
And that crusade, even though it was uh, never officially declared for this country, it was acknowledged by this Bishop Hughes that the same treatment given to these godly people in Europe is the same treatment that they should be given in this country. So the point has to be understood. Rome's intentions have never changed regarding politics, and that means that Vatican Council II was indeed no offer of reconciliation, but it was an ultimatum. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church or else. That was Vatican Council II in the 1960s. John F. Kennedy was president, Eisenhower and Kennedy, <coughs> and this was all taking place in the light of day. And what is most ghastly to me is that the Protestant pastors of this country didn't understand the true message of Vatican Council II. They took it as an offertory of peace and unity among the Christian world, that there should be peace and unity between Protestants and Catholics. But what it really was, was a reiteration of the Council of Trent. And it was stated that nothing in Vatican Council II contradicted or amended or changed anything that took place at the Council of Trent. So while all this apparent lovey-dovey language was included in Vatican Council II, what it really was was a frosting-covered ultimatum. An ultimatum. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church even if it's kicking and screaming, you either come back to the Roman Catholic Church or else. Now, what does the or else mean? That you be rounded up and put in the penitentiary. That's the purpose of the government of this country, to serve the Pope. And to continue this perpetual crusade against the heretics. You have a choice. Vatican Council II gave you the choice. You want to remain identified as a heretic you will receive the judgment of a heretic. If you wish to recant of your Protestantism and stop condemning the Roman Catholic Church, stop calling the Pope the Antichrist, stop condemning the sacraments, stop being Protestants, even if you do not want to be Roman Catholics, at least stop this criticism of the Roman Catholic Church or else... That's the ultimatum that was Vatican Council II in 1960. It was just an, an enactment of what should have been learned by the Protestants of this country when this debate took place between Bishop Hughes and, and, and the other party, uh, uh, Breckenridge. It was stated early on in this country that Rome had not changed her opinion of heresy and had not changed her intentions with heresy. They're going to be put down in this country, and it's going to be the civil government that's going to do it. Now, people are saying, well, Tom, you're living in the medieval age. We're in the modern era. Rome doesn't do these things anymore. Well, I've explained over and over and over what, what World War I was what World War II was, what the Vietnam War was, they were nothing but Holy Roman Crusades. And they obtained Roman Catholic objection, uh, objectives, Vatican objectives. And such is the case even with the current war on terror against the Muslims and anybody else who seems to be offensive in this country. And they've demonized these people They've, they've uh, well, simply demonized them as fundamentalists. And this country goes dutifully traipsing off to war with their own blood and their own guts and their own, fu their own money, their own tax money, to kill these so-called heretics 
these fundamentalists, and the same is going to happen to Protestant USA. Bible-believing fundamental Christians. They've lumped us all together, not differing between the holy and the profane. History is repeating itself. It's doing it right before our very eyes. The trouble is, <coughs> Christians in this country can't recognize it because they're not familiar with this history. They're not familiar with the Roman Catholic Church. They, Because they've been taught futurism from the cradle, they don't have any idea that the papacy is the Antichrist. To most Christians in this world, the papacy looks like, even though he dresses kind of funny and carries that stupid stick around with him, and the little red shoes and all, and the big fancy gaudy churches and the pedophile priests and all, at least they profess Jesus is the Christ. So they must be Christian, right? It's because we're not privy to this history that we can come to such ridiculous conclusions. The history that we're reading on this program this morning is vitally important to our understanding, both of Scripture and history and prophecy. You can't understand current events unless you understand the history that we're reading in this book this morning. You are bound to come to the wrong conclusions except for this history. Okay? God's people are to not to serve two masters. We're to serve Christ and Him alone. And Jesus has but one vicar on the earth, and that's the Holy Spirit, the one He left in His place when He went back to, the, to be with His Father to make room for us. Now, anybody who asserts to himself the position of the vicar of Christ is simply calling himself the Holy Spirit. What's well, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? That won't be forgiven in this life nor the life to come. The Bible plainly says. And who is it speaking of? The only one in history, the only institution in the history of this world that has ever claimed to be the vicar of Christ or the replacement of the Son of God who has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. That's the papacy. It's, it's just a no-brainer. And uh, it almost seems to be a futile effort on my part to continue to talk about this. It just doesn't seem to have... This message just doesn't have to seem... This just doesn't seem to have any fertile soil in this country. Very, very little. But I can't cease to talk, to, to talk about it. It's so vitally important to every member of my family, every member of the true Bible-believing Christian world, and I simply cannot walk away from this ministry. I don't know what else I would do with my life. To put away the most important subject known to man and to leave... No voice of truth about it. The pressure is immense for me to stop this ministry. To stop coming to First Amendment Radio and speaking to an empty room. But the Spirit of God compels me. The truth compels me. The Bible compels me. The Spirit of Almighty God compels me. And I'm going to continue. Now, the author continues on page 304. He says, There can be little doubt that the crying offense of all these classes of heretics, notwithstanding the Pope's endeavor to blacken their memory by speaking all manner of evil against them falsely, was that which was named by Thuanus, the Roman Catholic historian, already cited. He said, quote, because they invade too vehemently against the wealth, the pride, and the vices of the popes, and alienated the people from obedience to them. That's what these people all had in common. Both the criminal element and 
the holy element. They all together criticized, vehemently criticized the wealth, the worldliness, the pride, the vices, the false doctrines, the simony, the sodomy, the sacraments, everything about the Roman Catholic Church, and they were alienating the whole European continent against obedience to them. The whole continent of Europe was beginning to perceive the papacy as the Antichrist because of these people's testimonies. He continues, he says, Pope Alexander III, the author of the, the above persecuting edict, was succeeded in 1181 A.D. by Pope Lucius III, that is, Antichrist, Pope Lucius III. Two years before this, in 1179, we can con uh, uh, determine, a man by the name of Peter Waldo, who with his followers had been anathemati anathematized by Pope Alexander, died in Bohemia. Okay? Peter Waldo was a Waldensian. He was a Protestant. He was a Puritan. He was of the holy portion of this decree. And he sold everything that he had. Gave up all of his wealth. He was a wealthy merchant. And he sold all that he had. And he became a full-time minister. Ministering the gospel. He was a Bible-believing Christian. And he gave up all that he had and dedicated his whole life to preaching against Rome. To preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures. Even when it was unlawful to do so. At this period of time, if you were caught with a Bible on you, you were ranked as a heretic. You were hauled into the Inquisition. The Bible was a venomous book, according to the papacy. And if you were caught in possession of one, you were just lumped in with the criminals. <clears throat> because the logical conclusion of anyone who can read and understand the Scriptures is that the man of sin, the son of perdition, describes the papacy and no one else. There's no other alternative. And thus, like all Bible-believing Christians, Peter Waldo came to the same conclusion that everyone else did, that the Pope was the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. And he went on a full-time ministry against the Church, against the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Peter Waldo, who with his followers had been anathematized by Pope Alexander, died in Bohemia. Okay? Pope Alexander anathematized him or damned him because he was a Protestant. He was a criticizer of the popes and all their worldliness and all their pretended power and the Roman Catholic Church and all the kings of the earth that, that carried it wherever she wanted to go. He finally died in Bohemia. But did that stop the truth? We've come to the break. We'll take a little moment, and then we'll come back, continue where we left off. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. First on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded It has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern, or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to contact me, my snail mail address is P.O. Box 304, Jefferson, Iowa, 50129. The the, uh, email is tom at cwaves.us. The website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now, we're talking about Peter Waldo. <clears throat> Many people erroneously assume that uh, this great godly man uh, was the namesake of the Waldenses, that somehow the name Waldenses came from Peter Waldo's name, which is incorrect. Peter Waldo was just one of the Waldenses. The Waldensian name comes from the Vaudois, the French word Vaudois, which means the valley people. They were the ones who were held up in the uh, Codian Alps, the uh, the valleys of the Alps, and they were godly people. They were Bible-believing Christians, <coughs> and Rome, lent, uh, Rome issued crusade after crusade after crusade against these godly people. But Peter Waldo was just one of these Protestants, of all the Protestant sects that Uh, existed at that time. Peter Waldo was just one of them. And I implore my listeners to do your own research on Peter Waldo and find out what he believed and how he spread the gospel of Jesus and how he also condemned the papacy just like all other Protestants throughout history. All the way back to the first century Christians who under Paul's ministry understood who the Antichrist would be. It would be that power which would replace the, the power that was then in power, the Caesars. And uh, they anticipated the rise of the papacy, and because of that they prayed for the longevity of the pagan Roman Caesars, even though they crucified them, even though they burnt them at the stake, even though they fed them to the lions in the public Colosseum in Rome. They prayed for the health, wealth, and prosperity and longevity of the Caesars because they knew an even greater monster would replace him. And Peter Waldo was one of these who knew who the Antichrist was because of Paul's ministry. And the saints, like Peter Waldo, with this vital information, 
and knowledge and understanding went back all the way to the first century. There has never been an age or a generation in the history of the Christian era that it was not known who the Antichrist is, unless you can you think about our generation. We may be, in our generation, the only generation since the first century church who is clueless about who the Antichrist is, and I think that's an unspeakable crime. The consequences of that error are inestimable, in my opinion. And it, the, the, this is why Inquisition Update is so dedicated <coughs> to informing God's people with indisputable tr uh, proofs, innumerable indisputable proofs, who the Antichrist is. And so that none of us would be deceived by him. And Peter Waldo was of the same spirit. He wanted everyone to know who the Messiah was, who Jesus was, the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation by grace through the shed blood of Jesus. And then along with that comes the natural necessity of warning the people who the counterfeit Christ is so that God's people would not be deceived by him. And that was Peter Waldo's mission. A very, very rich man, a merchant who sold everything that he had and gave it to the poor and took the life of a hermit and preached in the streets. And he was condemned by the Pope, just like anyone else like him who preached against the Antichrist. He was condemned and anathematized by Pope Alexander III, and he eventually died in Bohemia. But his people lived on. Protestants have never ceased to exist in this world. He said, some suppose these dissenters from the corruptions of Rome, though they had existed for centuries before, and I correct the author, they existed for a full millennium before, <coughs> derived from Waldo, the name of the Waldenses. Okay, they erroneously think the Waldenses are named after Peter Waldo. It's, a, it's an honest mistake, because the Waldenses believe the same thing that Peter Waldo believed. But Waldensians literally comes from the French, because that's where they were mostly populated in France. And in this case, we're talking about the Albigensians who were concentrated in the south of France. These Waldensians were called the Vaudois, or the Valley People, and they lived in the Alps, in the valleys of the Alps. A natural cathedral, a natural holy place. And uh, they were persecuted into this, this area because of the Roman Caesars. Okay, These were the true Christians in Rome who were persecuted and sought refuge in the Alps, that impenetrable fortress of innumerable valleys, fertile valleys in, this, in, the, in the impenetrable Alps, where Rome couldn't get to them. Okay? They took their people, they took their Bibles, and they got out of Rome. Rome had given up the truth. It was obvious Rome was no place to preach the gospel. No one was going to receive it there. So they went to the valleys in the Alps where the papacy pursued them and continued to pursue them for centuries to try to, to, try to exterminate them. Now some suppose these dissenters from the corruptions of Rome, these Waldensians, though they had existed centuries before, uh, be derived from Waldo, the name of Waldenses, which in after ages almost supersedes the various other names by which they had long been known. And we've named them, <coughs> and I won't name them again. I've lumped them all together under the name of Protestant, and that's truly what they were, including the Waldensians. Okay? 
And it said, through the preaching of Waldo, Peter Waldo, I invite you to do your own research, that through the preaching of Waldo, many had renounced the corruptions of popery and were in consequence exposed to the vengeance of Rome. Okay? If, if you renounce Rome, if you renounce the Roman Catholic Church, if you renounce the papacy as the Antichrist, you are going to be, be you are going to be vehemently persecuted and pursued by Rome. That's your lot. That is what you can expect. Okay? Rome has always persecuted those who positively identify the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church for what they are. Okay? This is why the saints throughout the ages have bled and died. Uncountable multitudes at the hand of the, of the papists. And no one takes it to heart. No one even knows about it in this country almost. And certainly they don't talk about it if they do know about it. Because of the futurist teaching. That the Antichrist is not the Pope. That the future Antichrist has not even come in the world yet. And so the memory of the martyrs that have been slain by the popes and all the kings of Europe throughout the centuries, throughout the entire Christian era, are forgotten about. Okay? It's because we no longer church uh, teach from the Protestant pulpits the false doctrines of Rome and the disgusting, diabolical history of the popes. And, and it's just an a subject that has even become taboo in the churches. He says, Through the preaching of Peter Waldo, many had renounced the corruptions of popery and were in consequence exposed to the vengeance of Rome. Thirty-five were burned together in one fire in the city of Benjamin, and eighteen in the city of Mentz. The bishops of both Mentz and Strasbourg breathed nothing but vengeance and slaughter against them. And in the latter city, where Waldo himself is said to have narrowly escaped apprehension, 80 persons were committed to the flames. They pursued them everywhere they could be found. Okay? Now, subsection 63, we're on page 304 if you're following along. He says, to show that the apostate church of Rome is responsible for these horrid butcheries, we will quote a few passages from a decree of the supreme head of that church, Pope Lucius III, issued in 1182, or rather 1184 A.D. This bloody edict commences as follows, quote, to abolish the malignity of diverse heresies, which are lately sprung up in most parts of the world, it is but fitting that the power committed to the church, the Roman Catholic Church, should be awakened, that by concurring assistance of the imperial strength, that is, the governments of the world, the civil governments of the world, that by concurring assistance of the imperial strength, both the insolence and malpertness of the heretics in their false designs may be crushed and the truth of the Roman Catholic simplicity shining forth in the Holy Church may demonstrate her pure and free of the execrableness of their false doctrines. Okay? Therefore, continuing with the edict, therefore we, that is the popes, being supported by the presence and power of our most dear son, Frederick, that is, the emperor of all of Christendom, the most illustrious emperor of the Romans, always increaser of the empire, with the common advice and counsel of our brethren and other patriarchs, archbishops, and many princes, who from the several parts of the world are met together, do set themselves against these heretics, 
to have gotten different names from the several false doctrines which they profess. By the sanction of these present, this present decree and by our apostolic authority, according to the tenor of these presents, we condemn all manner of heresy by whatever name soever that it may be denominated. More particularly, we declare all Catharists, Paterines, and those who call themselves the poor of lions, these are the men that were the followers of Peter Waldo, they call themselves the poor of lions, <coughs> the Passagines, the Josephites, the Arnaldists, to be under a perpetual anathema. Now, do I have to, you know, give the definition of the word perpetual anathema? I will, for those who don't know. Perpetual is just another word to say everlasting. Perpetual is forever. And the word anathema means damnation. Okay? So the papacy placed these godly people under a perpetual damnation. Now, what does that say for those who are caught up in the ecumenical movement? You're being duped. Rome never changes. If there's truly peace and harmony to be proposed by the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestant churches, well, they've violated Roman Catholic canon law. And when push comes to shove at the traditionalists of the Roman Catholic Church, those of the Latin Rite, those of the extreme right-wing sect of the Roman Catholic Church can ever declare Vatican Council II a heresy, and that every pope since Pope John the Twenty-Third who convened Vatican Council II a heretic, Rome's attitude is going to be what it has always been, what I attest that it is even so today, a perpetual anathema is issued to every non-Roman Catholic who calls himself a Christian. And especially if you are outspoken against the papacy, against his priests, against his pedophiles, against his persecutions, against his simony, his sodomy, his sacraments, everything about the Roman Catholic Church, you are under a perpetual anathema. It will never be lifted. You are damned by the Roman Catholic Church. You will never be undamned by any power in heaven or in earth or in the underworld, according to Roman Catholic canon law. And it is the, the, the stated objective of every king of the earth to impose upon you that perpetual anathema by whatever means at its disposal. Okay? And if any time any situations arise at any time when this perpetual pursuant perpetual uh, pursuance of the Protestants must be suspended for a time, it is to be reinstated at the earliest opportunity. Whenever it is safe for the Roman Catholic Church to do so, she will persecute the saints of the Most High. So those of you who are thinking that you've got some kind of a peace and unity going with the Roman Catholic Church, don't turn your back. Don't sleep with both eyes closed. Because your day is coming. Rome will never lift this perpetual anathema against you. And even if she takes you into her fellowship, and you appear at least for a time a card-carrying Roman Catholic, they know your Protestant roots. And you will never be trusted amongst them. Your peace will be super, superficial at best. And at the earliest opportunity, they will do as they have done to all godly Christians throughout the centuries. We have two millennia 
two millenniums, two consecutive millenniums, 2,000 years of irrefutable history to prove what Rome's intentions are. And they will never change. And if those intentions and those anathemas, those papal bulls, those damnations, those crusades are ever changed, the Roman Catholic Church has proved itself to be a false church, according to their own definition. So they are bound to persecute. Roman Catholic canon law and the, and the, and the, cons- the concurrent rule of the popes from the first to the last is to rout out heresy. And that's what she will do. The last 2,000 years of history leaves no wiggle room for doubt. Now he continues, he says, and because some under a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, as the apostle saith, assume to themselves the authority of preaching. You know, you, you, you heretics out there, if you su- assume to yourself the authority of preaching without being sent by the Roman Catholic Church, you've committed an unpardonable sin in the Roman Catholic Church. He says, and because some under a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, as the apostle saith, assume to themselves the authority of preaching, whereas the same apostle saith, how shall they preach unless they be sent? We therefore conclude under the same sentence of perpetual anathema, all those who either being forbid or not sent by the Roman Catholic Church do notwithstanding presume to preach publicly or privately without any authority received from the apostolic see or from the bishops of their respective dioceses. Okay? So that perpetual anathema is especially directed to all of those who preach the gospel and those who preach against the papacy. Anyone who presumes to preach who has either not been forbid or has not been specifically sent by the Roman Catholic Church to preach, if you're caught preaching, you're going to be burned at the stake. This perpetual anathema is for you. Okay, So if you're a Waldensian, you obviously have been forbidden to preach by the Roman Catholic Church, and you're certainly not sent to preach by the Roman Catholic Church, you are to keep your mouth shut on pain of death. And if you open your mouth and you presume to preach either publicly or privately without the express authority received by the Pope himself or from one of his powerful bishops, in every locality in all of Christendom, then you are under the ban. You are under this perpetual anathema. Now look, he has just pronounced a death sentence to anyone who is not specifically authorized by the papacy to preach. In other words, you have to have on your person a license or an indulgence to, to preach. And if you're caught preaching and you don't have that authorization, you're, you're a dead man. So anybody caught preaching, either in private or public, when questioned to prove your qualifications, your license to preach, you better produce it. You better produce it quick. Because the chains of Rome are ready to bind you, cast you in the Inquisition, and kill you. And if the church just happens to be too busy at the time, the king or the civil government of your locality is to work in their place. To bind you in chains, to throw you in prison, and silence you by the most efficient means. Permanently. You know, I had these discussions on amateur radio many, many years ago 
not so many years ago, by the way. And I was asked that question if once a thousand times. Do you have a license to preach? Do you have a license to preach? I have to ask the question. Do pastors and preachers have to have a license to preach in this country? Do your qualifications have to be on you to preach in this country? You know, Paul must have made a mistake when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He forgot to issue licenses. Paul was absent-minded in that regard. So says the Pope. And I was asked constantly if I had a license to preach. Let me answer you all at once. No. I don't have a written license from the Pope or any flesh and blood man to preach the gospel. And I don't seek one, nor would I receive one. <coughs> I have a command to go ye into all the world to preach the gospel. And I don't need a license from anybody. But if you lived in this time of the popes, if you live in the lives of the popes, you're required to have a license to preach, either publicly or privately. And if you preach without an express written permission, as either recorded by the Apostolic See or by the bishop of your local community, you're under the ban. And if you're not summarily apprehended, accosted, placed in the Inquisition, doesn't mean the ban has been lifted. Don't entertain yourself with that folly. It's just come a time when it's not convenient for the Roman Catholic Church to persecute you. But you're under the ban. It's a perpetual ban. It's Roman Catholic canon law that cannot be changed. And at the earliest opportunity, when it's convenient for the church, the sentence will be executed. And that's where we are today in this country. I'll be traveling for the next few days. People, pray for me, please. In Jesus' name, pray for me. I'll be back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built, 
That's crosstheborder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.